and uh, I want to I want to cover something in reference to these crowns. Now we've been over the incorruptible crown, uh, the crown of life, which we talked about, the martyr's crown, and doing things that are right. You can get the CDs for all this. Uh, the crown of righteousness and the crown of rejoicing. The only thing we lack is the crown of glory, which um, we'll get over to maybe tonight. Uh, but I I want to I want to deal with something tonight that uh, a lot of Christians have yet to understand. Um, the Holy Spirit is a personal, individual thing. Deals with you on an individual basis, not corporately, and He doesn't deal with you through. Uh, husband, wife, mom, dad, kids, all that other stuff. He deals with you personally, individually. Each one of you has in you the ability to develop your own relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's important that you develop that relationship. Now, I realize He uses all these other things to, to try to help us to know what He wants to tell us. But ultimately, when you get up to heaven... One of the things that many people mistake or don't understand is, is that when you give account of yourself uh, to uh, God up there, it is not going to be you being able to blame somebody else for the position you find yourself in. When you get up there to heaven, you're not going to be able to say, well, I was ignorant, I was stupid, I just didn't know. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 says you do know. But you have to be willing to make the right choices when God gives you the light. You've got to be willing to do what God tells you to do. It doesn't make any difference what anybody else tells you to do. Uh, you remember in 1 Kings chapter number 13 where the little prophet's coming back from uh, preaching to the king over there and uh, everybody's like, well, you know, how come he's over there and this other prophet comes up and, tell, and talks to him and tells him? I'll tell you why. Because the lesson that that little prophet had to learn was, is that if God tells you to do something, I don't care who it is that tells you otherwise, you better not listen to them because what they say doesn't trump what I say. That boy goes over there and the old preacher comes up to him and says, hey man, why don't you come over and sit down and eat with me? And he figures, well, I guess it would be alright for me to go over and sit down and eat with him. And he goes and sits down and eats with him. But the Lord told him, the Lord told him, you don't eat nothing until you get back to the house and you fasted from going over there and talk to that king. And he went over and he preached the message. He comes back and he sits around the table and he eats. And that boy leaves on the donkey and the lion eats that, that boy up. You know why? Because of one reason and one reason alone. And that is because that guy listened to somebody get between him and the Lord. That's a dangerous situation to get involved in. I'll give you a couple more illustrations of that. Let's pray. Father... Thank you for tonight. Thank you for the good uh, Bible study today, Lord. I thank you, God, for the people that showed up, the ones that were able to get here. God, I thank you for the people that are here now. And we'd ask, Lord, as we come to you with upturned palms and empty bellies, Lord, and a parched throat, that you might quench our thirst and fill up our bellies. And, Lord, meet our needs tonight, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. First Corinthians 2. Now, I'm going to move fast because i got uh, about three hours worth of stuff to put in about 40 minutes. Don't hold me to the 40 minutes. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Notice what he says in verse 9. We've been over this many times. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love Him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. All right, stop right there. Question. When you got saved, did you get the Holy Spirit or not? Yes. If that is the case, the Bible says that you have the ability to know the things that are of God, the spiritual things of God, so the problem or the caveat becomes whether or not you really want to know them. And the problem is, is that a lot of times you may not like the package which the truth is contained in. But it doesn't negate the fact that God's given you a chance to know the truth, but you may not like the way the truth is dispensed. All right, now notice what he says. He says, For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Verse 11, What man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even man knows the things about man. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. No other the Spirit of God knows them. Man doesn't know them. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. All right, now if they're freely given to you by God, then tell me what excuse an individual living in the United States of America has for not knowing the truths of the judgment seat of Christ, not knowing the truths about eternity, not knowing the truths about heaven, not knowing the truths of the thing that God has put out there. You say, well, preacher, nobody's saying it. But God said that He'd give you the opportunity if you're interested in the opportunity. He doesn't say when. It may not come right at salvation. It may be after you get a belly full of a bunch of things and God finally says, okay, 
Fears the light, and he turns the light on, but you better walk in the light as he is in the light, First John says. And if you don't, you know what happens? You'll find yourself in darkness. Walk in the light as he is in the light, and we'll have fellowship one with the other. The problem is that people don't understand when the Lord Jesus Christ starts going this way, if you'll walk with Him where He's walking, you'll be in the light. If you choose to go in a different direction, the lights just went out, buddy, and last time I checked, unless you're completely blind, you can't see in the dark. So the reason that a lot of spiritual blindness is going on today is because, number one, people don't want to walk in the light. Number two, they're willingly blind and they don't want to see what God's trying to show them. They're happy with what they have. It's not that they don't want the truth. It's that they don't like sometimes what goes with the truth. Notice what he says in verse number 14, uh, verse 13, "...which also things we speak, not in words, which man's wisdom teacheth, but look who does the teaching." The Holy Ghost teaches. You say, why? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Because that way, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, which we're going to talk about in just a minute where these crowns are given out, that way you can't blame a man for not teaching you because God says, I'm the one accountable for teaching you and I'll teach you, but you've got to be willing to learn. And if you're not willing to learn, He'll let you stay somewhere, stuck somewhere from now on, and just go ahead and rot until you get to the judgment seat of Christ because the Lord's like, hey, I tried to tell you, I tried to teach you. You say, well, how does He do it? I don't know, but the Bible says He does it. I know that sometimes He'll show you a little bit of light and He waits to see if you'll walk in the light. But the Lord's moving. Uh, the Lord's like got a lantern out here and if you keep walking and that light keeps moving. But you know what? It's dark behind Him. And if you're not willing to go when He goes, you're going to miss the light. And light that is rejected becomes lightning, and then your conscience gets seared. You couldn't see it. Man, listen, you've had better than a thousand people that have come through the doors of this place than the nearly 20 years I've been here, 18 years, however long it's been that I've been here. Over the thousand people that are not here. You say, what is it? Well, the light was here. They didn't like the package or whatever their reason was. You say, what will happen to them? Well, either they'll use what they learned here and God will show them the light somewhere else or they get judgment seat of Christ when they get down there and the Lord says, okay, give an account. Well, Lord, I didn't know. Oop, time out. Didn't you visit that place over there? I mean, that's if this is the place. That's if the truth is really here. Now, if it's not, then you can throw it all out in the garbage can. But if this is, and I believe it is, if this is the place, then you know what? God says, well, I had, well, I don't like people that yell. Well, I don't like people that don't have programs. Well, they go over there sing a couple songs. The lady gets up and sings a special. And then the guy gets up and just starts screaming. That's right off. They don't even give us a chance to get situated. I mean, he just starts right off the bat. And he's talking to the cotton picking fast. I can't even keep up with him. I mean, why should I want to go? The Lord says, I, I'm, because I'm trying to show you something stupid. That's why. Trying to find out, trying the reins to see whether or not you really want the truth or if you just, you know, you want all the trappings and the trimmings, but you don't really want what goes with that. That's a dangerous situation that you get yourself into. And then the problem is, is that people say, well, uh, preacher, you know, I, I just feel it don't matter how you feel. When you get to eternity, the judgment seat of Christ, where the, where the crowns are given out, you are not going to blame somebody else for what you're doing. Now watch what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, and you've been over this a dozen times, but it's important for you to get it a dozen more. You say, why? This is where you're going. Uh, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to a place I've never been before, I check the map pretty regular, and i got one of them little things in there, but sometimes I, I bump that thing to make sure it's heading me in the right direction. And there's a lot of times that I'm looking on there where that... I, I don't know why it's a, it has to be a woman telling me where I'm going, but anyway... So, I guess they're better at directions or something. But this woman comes on there and turn right at, at in one half mile. And I'm thinking, why would I want to turn right? I don't think that's the right way to go. So I check it. And sometimes I'll pull the map out. You know why? Because sometimes she knows the route better than I do. And it's better for me to follow what she's telling me to do than what I think is right to do. That's the Holy Spirit. You may not understand why He's telling you to turn right, but He knows the way to get there better than you do. You've got to check on where you're going on a regular basis. You've never been there. So keep check. Now watch what happens when you get there. And uh, verse number 8, two, uh, five, eight. Uh, We are confident, and I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Whether we la- uh, that wherefore, we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Now, I'm accepted of Him because I'm in Jesus Christ. This is not talking about salvation, the context of the passage has to do with judgment seat of Christ. How do I know? Verse 3, If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Ties in with Revelation chapter number 3. We're in a tabernacle that groans. And why are we working? Why are we doing something? So that when we're there, we get the right kind of robe for what we did. We get gold, silver, and precious stones. It has nothing to do with your salvation. 
A lady told me one time, she came here, she said, Preacher, I just feel like I'm behind. I said, well, then catch up. She said, well, you know, there's just so much. And I'm, I'm intimidated because you all seem to know so much about the Bible. I said, you know what? If you were in a job and you were trying to get promoted or something, there's people that have been there working 20 years. What are you going to do? Walk in and say, well, boss, you know, them, they know more than I already do. So I quit because I can never catch up with them. I said, no, you'd stay at the job. You'd learn what you had to learn so that you could get promoted. But when it comes to something spiritual, if you've got to put any spiritual sweat into something, it's like, well, I, it's too much for me. I'll never catch up. Why don't you get off your lazy uh, 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 blessed assurance and get something done? Why don't you catch up? Why don't you have an emphasis on it? Why don't you care? That's where you're headed. That's where you're going to spend eternity. That's who you're going to spend eternity with. Why don't you know something about it? I'll tell you why. When it comes to spiritual things, you've grown lazy and you've grown fat like Israel. Said, well, I don't need it. I'm just thank God for eternal security. Once saved, always saved. Well, thank God. That's true. But there's a little more to it. There's a thing coming called the judgment seat of Christ where God wants to give you rewards, but He ain't going to give you rewards for being lazy. You've got to learn some things. Uh, you know, nowadays it's just, well, preacher, just, just tell us something. Just tell us something. That's why the preacher gets up and all he does is tell you how to be saved and how to get people saved and how to tithe and that kind of stuff. Make sure you come to visitation. Make sure you teach a Sunday school class. Uh, make sure you, you, know, you, 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 you make a pledge and you do all this other kind of foolishness. They don't teach you about God. You know why? Because they know Christians are generally lazy, and if you put spiritual pressure on them to learn something, they'll leave. Well, I don't care if you learn or not. At least learn something by osmosis. You ever realize how much Bible these kids pick up around here? You think they're sleeping and stuff, and they wind up spouting that stuff back to you when you're riding down the road? They pick it up, man. I don't care if they go to sleep in here. It doesn't bother me at all. But ladies and gentlemen, there is a spiritual responsibility that is incumbent upon every one of us to learn about our Creator and what He's going to do for us. You say, why? Because He's going to hold you accountable. See, but preacher, I, I, I didn't know. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You live in the United States of America. You have a Bible-believing work that's near enough to you that you can get to, and you got a Holy Bible, and you have no, absolutely no excuse. In Romans chapter 1, if He's not going to hold the unsaved without excuse because nature will tell them, how much more you think He's going to hold you and me accountable? But we have in us the Holy Spirit of God, and by Him, by the way, He breathed on the waters and all the creation took place. Could I ask you a question? What excuse are we going to have? Notice what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm not getting on to you. I'm just trying to prepare you. I'm just trying to tell you. I'm just so that you'll get ready so that when the time happens, it won't be like, Oh God, I didn't know there was going to be a pop quiz today. It ain't a pop quiz. It should not be a surprise. It should be, hey, man, we knew the test was coming. So what do you do if you know a test is coming? Well, you know what? Unless you're a complete idiot, you prepare. Right? Because why? You want to pass the test. Notice what he says. In First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians, chapter number five, verse number ten. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now watch. Here comes the personal part. That every one personal may receive the things done in his body personal, according to that he personal hath done, whether it be good or bad. So when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, it is not going to be Mamma and Grandma and Papa and Grandma and Grandpa. It is not going to be the preacher. It's not going to be a husband. It's not going to be the wife. It's not going to be the kids. You ain't going to blame nobody when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, when you stand before your Creator and you got to give an account. It's going to be you and God and Him alone, a personal audience, and your own willingness to sit there and talk to Him, and He's going to know everything there is to know about you. Now, how do I know that's true? In Genesis chapter number 3, Adam tried the escape route, and his escape route was Eve. And the Lord comes down there in the cool of the evening, and he walks up there to Adam, and he says to Adam, he says, Hey, uh, Adam, let me ask you a question. He said, Where are you at? And Adam says, uh, well, Why are you asking that? He said, Well, Adam, usually I meet you right here in this spot. We go for a walk in the cool of the evening. Where are you at? He goes, Well, I'm over here in the bushes. What are you doing in the bushes, Adam? Uh, well, uh, well, Lord, strange things happened to me. Uh, I, 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 I found out I was naked. You know, what do you mean you found out you were naked? Who told you you were naked? Hey, boy, let me ask you a question. There's only one way you could know you were naked. Did you eat that tree? You know what Adam's response is? It wasn't, yes, Lord, I did, and I was wrong, and I shouldn't have done it. You know what he said? Lord, you know that woman that you gave me? If it hadn't been for that cotton-picking woman, Lord, I, I wouldn't have ate that tree. Yeah, I ate it, but it was her fault she gave it to me. And you know what he does? He immediately moves from Adam to Eve. And he says to Eve, he says, Eve, let me ask you a question. Did you eat that tree? Well, if she don't answer. You know what she says? Well, Lord, the, the, the serpent that you put out here in the garden, he was down here and he's the one that tempted me to do it. And Lord, I, 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 if it wasn't for him, you know who the Lord curses? He curses all three of them. 
He holds every one of them personally accountable for the decision they made. Adam couldn't blame the woman, the woman couldn't blame the serpent, and the serpent had nobody to blame. I'm telling you, when you get the judgment seat of Christ, you are not going to be able to blame your husband, your wife, your mama, your daddy, your grandma, your grandpa, the preacher, or anybody else. You are personally going to give an account for your knowledge of what God's taught you in that book and what you did in your body according to whether it be good or whether it be bad. You will give a personal account for that yourself. Uh, the Lord's up there hanging on Calvary's cross. And this is a hard thing for Southerners to get. Southerners do not understand. They think that there has been so much today on the family, the family, the family, the family, the family, that the worship of the family is more important than the worship of God. Now, we work God in there because, you know, without God, we wouldn't have a family kind of thing. And what you don't understand is, is when you get up there to heaven, God is not going to separate you, as I said in Bible study, of the Waters family, the Peacock family, the Joneses, the Johnsons, and the Mannings, and, and everybody's going to have this little family time. We're all going to sit around and see though the circle be unbroken. It'll not be that way. God doesn't put the emphasis on a physical family that man puts on the physical family. God puts the emphasis on the spiritual family. Now, let me give you something to put in your pipe and smoke. And I, listen, I hope you have 50 dozen children. I hope you raise them all, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I appreciate God to having a family. I believe you ought to stay married. I believe you ought to raise your children right. Don't go out of here and say that the preacher said, I'm trying to make a point to you that it is not God's precedent, not His priority to consider the physical family over the spiritual. And God's up there. Jesus Christ is dying on Calvary's cross. I didn't get many amens there, but that don't matter. God's up there dying on the phone. Uh, uh, that's God manifesting the flesh. Jesus Christ, He's dying. He looks down there and He sees His mama. And He says, oh, everybody better talk to Mary, you know, because Mary's the one that's going to help you out. You better No, He doesn't say that. You know what He says? He says, woman, behold thy son. Who is it? It's John. She has living relatives around. You know why? John is not a blood relative. John is the one whom Jesus loved, and John put the spiritual over the physical. John didn't say, hey, I need to tell all my brother, half-brothers out here and stuff. They need to take care of their mom and this and that and the other. He says, John, behold thy mother, and woman, behold thy son. Doesn't call her mom. Says woman. Now, it's a strange thing. He's out there preaching one day. Uh, Lord, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Pardon me. i busting up the meeting here. But uh, your mother and your brethren are outside. And the Lord doesn't say, oh, my mother's out there. Oh, well, I need to run out there and talk to my mother. I mean, you know, my mother, she can get my attention any time. You know what he says? He says, my mother and my brethren are the ones that hear and do what I tell them to do and goes right on preaching. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever thought about this? If God places an emphasis more on the family than He does on the spiritual thing, can I ask you a question? How come you don't read nothing about Paul having children? I didn't say he didn't, I have, but how come it's not in there? Paul's your apostle, ain't he? How come so much focus on the family, the family, the family, the family, the family? I'll tell you where you get it. You get it from promises to Old Testament Israel. You get it from literal, physical, earthly inheritances. I'm all for having children. Have a parcel of them, man. Take care of them. Make sure you can pay for them. But I mean, have all the children you want. Raise them up, man. Thank God. But listen, you can raise all your kids and nurture and admonition of the Lord. You are not going to take over the earth with Christian children and then therefore we're going to bring in the kingdom. It ain't going to work that way. I don't care what Gothard says. Uh, that's a, that's a, anyway. All right. Now, now watch. You get moving along in that direction. People have a tendency to get real upset. Okay, well then let's look at Peter. Okay, we know Peter was married. He had a mother-in-law, right? How come you don't ever read about Peter's children? If being married and raising a family was so important, you would think that the example setter of all example setters would be Jesus Christ, right? How come he didn't get married? I don't care what the Mormons say. He didn't get married. He didn't have an illicit affair. Jesus Christ superstar and all that other kind of foolishness. He didn't do none of that kind of stuff. You know why? Because he wanted you to know there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing whatsoever wrong with that. So don't go out of here and say, oh, well, preacher said you don't believe in the family. That's not what I said. But I don't believe in the family over God Almighty. Amen. I do not believe in putting them ahead of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't believe in making decisions that please your family and displeasing God. I don't believe that's biblically correct and I'll stand on it and get tore up at the judgment seat of Christ if I'm wrong. I'm telling you, there is too much emphasis today on the earthly, on the physical, and too many people make decisions in light of what God would have them to do. I mean, what man would have them to do instead of what God would have them to do. 
And I'll give you an illustration of that. You don't want to get yourself in this position. I've seen a lot of men come to this church over the years. A lot of men come to the church. This is where God led me to be. This is where God wants me to be. God wants me to be in this place. There's no question God wants me to be here. I believe God's in me here. And their woman comes here the first time. Their wife comes here the first time. Or their kids come here the first time. Daddy, we don't like to go there. Honey, I ain't going there. That guy yells. He screams. Man, he spits. He sweats. He hops on pews. He scares people. He does this. He does that. They don't have programs and they don't have fun and they don't have music and they don't have rock and roll and they don't have contemporary this and contemporary that. And, you know, and, and there's just, it's just not any fun and that kind of thing. And the daddy goes, yeah, preacher, I believe God really led me here, but I, but you know, I, you know, I gotta have peace in the family. Okay. Peace in the family over peace with God. Okay. Fine. I listen. I, I don't have to live with the decision. Okay. So it's up to you if that's what you want to do. I'm not, I'm not saying that you don't have a right to make that decision, but let me just give you a list of word of caution. There's a passage in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel, or 1 Samuel, has to do with David, and he brings up the ark the right way this time. And when he gets that ark up there, he begins to thank God and praise God and hallelujah, glory to God, God's presence is here. And the Bible says, David danced before the Lord. Everybody remember that passage? Who do we mean to turn there? You remember the passage? Raise your hand if you remember the passage. Praise the Lord, man, you're reading your Bible. All right, now, so David gets up there. There's a woman up there. It's David's wife. And you know what she does? She peeps out the window and she sees David out there praising the Lord and jump, 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 dancing around out there and all that kind of stuff. And when David comes home, you know what she says to David? Oh, boy, fine spectacle the king made of himself today. And David said, hey, woman, I was worshiping the Lord. She don't ever back off and say, oh, uh, sorry, uh, apologize, I was wrong. You know what? She got between David and the Lord. Now watch what happens. David puts her away. Yes or no? He never, he doesn't divorce her, but he puts her away. She never bears any children. All right, a little bit later on goes on, the Gibeonites come in there and they say, hey, Saul made a promise to us and he didn't keep that promise. And so we got to have uh, five of his, uh, of his next of kin that we want to see hung for that. And David says, okay, I'll get you five. There happened to be six of them still living. Mephibosheth was one. He's the one that gets taken care of. The other five of them don't get taken care of. That's a whole message in itself. It'll make you shout, but I can't go there tonight. Those five of them are right there. Five, death, judgment, destruction. Those five come out there because of the sins of the granddaddy, because of what granddaddy did and stuff like that. But more than that, you know who is the adopted mama of those boys right there? It's that same woman that David put away and now she's trying to bear fruit artificially and she comes in there and says, well, I can't have my own children, but I can raise somebody else's children. You know what happens to them five boys? Them five boys are hung out and put on the rocks and the birds eat them and all that kind of stuff and they're out there put for everybody to see. You say, why? Because that woman got between God and David. And God didn't let her bear her own children and He didn't let her raise any children. He said, when I put you away, I mean you're put away. You ain't bearing no fruit. You know why? Because you got between me and somebody I was dealing with. Now, I know that's harsh. But you better realize that when it comes to eternity and you get up there in heaven, ladies and gentlemen, it ain't going to be, well, them, well, him, well, her, well, him, well, this, that. You ain't going to have no excuse. You get to the judgment seat of Christ you are not going to be able to claim that and you best be careful about stepping in between God dealing with somebody else and God. I don't care who you are. And I gave you a couple of illustrations of that in Bible study. That's a dangerous position to get in because you know what you've done when you do that? You're stepping in and saying, I know what's better for you. Uh, I've, seen, uh, I've seen people come here over the years and I've seen them meet somebody and pull them out of here, yank them out of here and stuff like that. And they figure, well, you know, I've had enough of it and so on and so forth. Somebody got between them. And you say, well, nothing happened to them. Accounts hadn't been settled yet. This account that we're, going to, that we're talking about, these five crowns we're talking about, that's the judgment seat of Christ. I want to make sure that if you don't get anything else that I preach to you tonight about the other stuff I'm going to tell you, I want to make sure you understand perfectly clearly that when you get up there, God is going to call you personally into account. You get a whole other name when you get up there. Did you know that? And your name ain't going to be Smith and Jones and Holland and Peacock and Waters and Johnson. and all. It ain't going to be that. It'll be a name after the Lord's name. Your family ties are dissolved. All that'll matter is your relationship to Him. Now, for those of you that have great families, you think, "Oh my God, I just can't. I just, I can't imagine." Well, it, for some people that didn't have a family worth raising a cat, that don't bother them at all. Everybody just thinks, "Well, what, 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 well, what about the people that have, you think they want to have a relationship with that kind of a family?" 
See, that just naturally upsets you. That just, well, I, well, I, I want to be seated with my family. You'll be seated with his family. What difference does it make? So you can't grab that. You, you, that that's, that's human nature. That's Japheth. He just can't get that he has to lose his identity to be pleasing to God. That's you. You can't get, when I get up there, I want to look in the mirror and see me. You're going to see him when you look in the mirror. A lot better looking than me and you. A lady asked me one time, she says, you mean I'm going to lose my image? And I said, I believe you are. The Bible says you're going to be conformed to His image. And she goes, well, that might just mean, you know, it's a glorified body and it's this and that and the other. I said, ma'am, honest to God, I said, here's your problem. You're in your 20s. I said, you give it another 50 years or so, you'll be glad to lose your cotton-picking image. Amen. I could go on with that, but I'll leave it right there. But folks... You have got to get your eyes on the eternal. And you have to stop making decisions on, does this please whoever it is? You please God. And let God work out the details. And, and, and if everybody else is hair-lipped, including the devil, then let them be hair-lipped, including the devil. If you please God, when you get the glory, God will put a crown on your head because you overcame that temptation to do what everybody else says to do because you're making the judgment light decisions in light of the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to put that to you easily. Uh, I don't think there's an easy way to put it. I can bet you this. I can bet you unless you've been at this church for any amount of time, you probably have never heard that. Because now the focus is off of Jesus Christ. Now the focus is on the family. Okay, can I ask you a question? What if you ain't got a family? What do you focus on then? How do you become spiritual and you don't have a family? See, people don't think of that. Suppose your family is busted up from stem to stern and everything else. Well, preacher, you know, just read. Okay, but, but wait a minute. I want to be spiritual and do right now. And my wife's remarried and I've done lost the custody of my kids. Now, now what am I, how am I going to be spiritual? You just can't be? Hogwash. It has nothing to do with your physical family. That's hard. Too much emphasis there. I wish to God some of you give as much preeminence to Him as you do to them. But what does the passage say? All right, one more passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and then we'll try to hit this other crown if I don't run out of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, you, you get up to heaven, the Lord's going to hold you accountable for what you know and why you didn't know. That doesn't mean you have to become a Bible study, a Bible uh, 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 st- uh, scholar. But you ought to know something. The Bible says that you each have the Holy Spirit in you. You have the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost means that He deals with you individually. Holy Spirit means He's dealing corporately. Okay? In a, in a group. So you each have the Holy Ghost in you individually, right? So... From the back over there to the front over here, every one of you has the Holy Ghost inside you and every one of you knows what's right to do. It ain't your conscience, it's Him. The Holy Ghost teaches you. He guides you, He directs you, and He teaches you. Okay? So tell me how you're going to blame Him when you get up there for not knowing. You know where the blame's going to go? I didn't learn because I didn't want to know. You ain't going to say, well, you didn't teach me. He's going to say, beg your pardon? You won't utter those words. That judgment seat of Christ, uh, leave your finger right there. Let me show you a tight picture of this thing in uh, Luke uh, 12. Uh, another thing Jessica brought up today. I take. A, I wish I had. A, I wish I had a, about three or four dozen like uh, like uh, Jessica. She comes back there in my office. I, I apologize because during Bible study I got sort of got sort of carried away. And I started hollering a little bit and all that. And then I realized I was in Bible study. And I said, I'm sorry, sister, I didn't mean to be uh, making it personal. I wasn't yelling at you and that kind of thing. And she comes back there in between the service. She said, Preacher, you yell at me anytime you want to. She said, I, I know what you're trying to do. She said, don't bother me at all. Said, but I wasn't yelling at you. She said, but I know that. But she said, that don't bother me at all. She said, make me think you love me. <laughs> Man, that's a kid. That was a blessing, man. Luke chapter number 12. <coughs> I know dispensationally the context of the passage has to do with the second advent, but there's an application for you. Now watch what he says. Luke chapter number 12. We'll start in verse number oh, 44, 43, um, 42. 
The Lord said, Who then is a faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord maketh ruler over his household, and give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he doth come, shall find him so doing, doing what God told him to do. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. You can fit that for the judgment seat of Christ. You can fit that for you as far as what's going on. I'll show you where the second advent comes in a minute. But you know what the Lord says? If you do what I told you to do, when you get up here, I'll give you a crown. What's the crown reference to? The crown is a reference to 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and Romans chapter number 8 when he says, if you suffer, you shall also reign. Crowns signify reigning. And it's a literal crown. I'm giving you this crown, you're going to rule over this. I give you this crown, you're going to rule over that. I give you this crown, you're going to rule over this. It's not ruling your body and ruling your members. You'll have a body and a mind like Christ. It's ruling over countries, nations, people. You get that if you just do what God tells you to do now. You say, well, how can Herbie get a crown like that? I'll tell you, because Herbie did what he knew to do. He was half-baked. He didn't know everything that was going on. I don't mean any disrespect by that. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't intellectually very intelligent. But he was smarter than a lot of Christians I know. He was smart enough to do the best he could to read. He couldn't read, man. He just had his Bible with him all the time. You never saw him without that New Testament in his pocket right there. Herbie'd walk all over that town, tell him he was caught picking fence posts about Jesus Christ. You know where you'd find him every Sunday? Right there where Brother Robert and Robin are sitting right there. Brother Robert and Sister Robin are sitting right there. You'd find Herbie sitting right there. You'd find him rain, sleet, snow, or shine. Hot, cold, it didn't matter. He'd be sitting right there unless he was deathly ill. Unless something was going on, that boy was at church every time them doors were open. And you know what he did? He'd go down there to the paper company and he would turn in his money and he'd come back down there and he'd throw his envelope in the plate, stand around show everybody and sing. You wouldn't call that singing. That guy'd get up there and just, oh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I was thinking, good night. You had to sing loud enough to drown him out. That's how he sang. And you know what? God's up there going, yeah, amen, Herbie. Lay it on, baby. Yes, sir, boy. That's it. Yes, you'll take the stew out of all these little uppity Christians in here, all of these little prim and proper. Yeah, man, grind on them, Herbie. Sand them down, baby. Let's go, man. I mean, the Lord's up there liking that stuff. You say, what will happen, buddy, when he got up there to heaven, man? He's running around on two good legs that aren't pigeon-toed, and his thumbs are turned up. You know why? Because he did what God told him to do with the ability that he had to do it. That's all you have to do. Just what you can. You don't have to try to get up. Well, what do you think I should do? Well, what do you think I should do? Ah, how the heck do I know? Ask him what you should do. You say, well, how could Herbie get a crown? Because he did what he could with what he had to offer. Buddy, I'll guarantee you, as soon as a touch of God hits that boy up there and he gets his mind straightened out and his body straightened out, you know what he'll be doing all around? Man, you know what? Man, I was a retard for God's glory down there. I mean, God touched me and I never had the mental capacity that if other people had. I never had the body that other people had. I never could touch the things. I couldn't play ball. I couldn't go to school. I couldn't learn things. Man, I walked around and hauled newspapers all my life. I mean, I stunk, man, and I did all this thing. Thank God, glory to God, He made me like that. If He hadn't, no telling what I'd have turned into. Glory to God, look at where I'm at now. If it wasn't for Him, I wouldn't be where I am. Thank God He even saves people like me. Well, glory to God, and He'll take off shouting and saying, Hallelujah! that God made me like He did. And all Christians do is run around and gripe all the time. You got a hundredfold what that old boy had. A hundredfold some of you could get something done, but you're too busy. Too much to do. Too many places to go. Too many things to see. And Herbie's up there saying, God, sure do appreciate you not making me like that. I'd have made a mess of my life. So you surely you don't believe that. You wait till we get up there. Herbie will meet you at the gate. Of course, you'll know him then as Herbie, and he'll say, hey, how you doing? I'm the one that preachers talk about all the time. You realize your preacher used to laugh at me and mock me and make fun of me? Thank God for that boy. I've been praying for him. I prayed for him when I was down there, when I was in that state. Mock me and making fun of me. You know why? Because he met me in church. Say, what'll that boy be? Lord, say, hey, Herbie, I got a whole cotton picking continent over here. They need a king. Herbie say, well, Lord, I, I couldn't do something like that. He said, oh, yeah, Herbie, you ruled little. I'll make you ruler over much. Herbie say, well, Lord, I sure appreciate it. If you can get any glory out of that, I sure. He said, well, Herbie, I've gotten quite a bit of glory out of you. Christian, the boy. My goodness, boy, 
You're going to be faithful with people like that at judgment seat of Christ. That boy let nothing stop him from being there. Invalid mother, sister couldn't hardly do anything, no daddy around. That's all I ever knew of him. It never stopped him. And you got excuses. You're too tired on Sunday night. He walked. Freezing cold outside. I can remember, I can't tell you how many times Daddy stopped by and said, Herbie, just wait over here and I'll pick you up and take you to the house. And I'd think, man, are we ever going to get there? I mean, he would drive for blocks. You know why nobody picked him up? Because he stunk so bad. I mean, once he was in your car, buddy, you knew he was in your car for a week after. You put the windows down and you had to put the stuff in. My daddy would pick him up and take him to the house. You know, it was a strange thing. That boy would come if it was pouring down rain. He'd sometimes put newspaper over his head and walk all the way to church. And he'd come after the service. It's pitch dark outside, sometimes snowing. That boy would take off walk back home. He never thought nothing on it. He never, he never, nobody give me a ride. Well, i got too much to do, man. I'm, I'm just too, it's just too far for me to walk down there. I'm, I'm, I just, I can't make it tonight. You know what? If he had, nobody would have said nothing. Nobody would have said a word. They'd say, hey, man, no, no kidding. I mean, I wouldn't blame him for not coming. His mom is at home, an invalid, in the bed, and he's got to get up and go to the next day and collect all them. Who would blame him? You couldn't keep that cat. If you chained the doors, I think he'd break the chains down, break the doors down. And you got excuses because you can't get to church. I can't get that. You think the preacher just gets upset because that's what preachers all say. No, I'm looking at people like Herbie. And I'm, you know what it does? It encourages me. I'm thinking, well, Lord, okay, if he can make it, I guess, I, 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 okay, Lord, I have no complaints. Good preaching. So you're going to face the judgment seat of Christ. You can get here. Not that hard. You can read. You can understand. Of truth, verse 44, I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But if, but and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, there you are. I don't think the Lord's coming. And shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken. So it's the type picture of a Christian that gets to the point thing, Ah, the Lord's not coming, the Lord's not coming, the Lord's not coming, so I'm just going to do what I want to do, my way. Verse number 46, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him. Now, that has to do with the second advent. I'll show you that in just a minute, but it also has to do for you as a Christian. If you're not looking for him, you're living the way you want to live. You're doing what you want to live, do. If most, most Christians, if they thought the Lord was going to come on a Wednesday night, they'd get here, wouldn't they? You know why they don't? They don't think he's coming on a Wednesday night. From the looks of the crowd, most people think he's coming Sunday morning. The Lord of the servant will come in a day when he looketh not, an hour when he is not aware, and he will cut him asunder, and will appoint his portion with the unbelievers. Now, that in the sense of you can't lose your salvation, that has to do with the second advent. But, in the sense of applying it for the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ, it would mean that you won't get any more than an unbeliever gets with a portion of the unbeliever than the unbeliever would get at the judgment seat of Christ, even though you're saved. You don't get the portion. You say, why? Because you lived how you wanted to live and did what you wanted to do because you thought, well, the Lord ain't coming, no big deal. Amen. Verse 47, And the servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, the Lord's will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Well, but preacher, now I just want to ask you a question. Now, what about the people that don't know? Uh, what about them? Well, look, verse 48, But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall still going to get beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required, and to whom men have committed much, of them they will ask more. Could I ask you this question? Do you really think when you get up there to the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord begins to talk to you that you're going to sit there and say to Him, Now, Lord, I just want to ask you a question. What about the people that didn't have a Bible? And Lord, what about the people that didn't know? And what about the people that were saved? You know what? You won't dare ask that. But you know why you ask it now? Because you're like a cotton-picking little worm trying to escape from a fire that's burning and you're trying to get away from it. And so what you're trying to do is, is oh, I'm just going to defend some poor innocent little individual that doesn't know. Then why don't you get off your blessed assurance and go teach them? Amen. If it bothers you that bad, why don't you saddle up and head over to the country where you think they are and quit using them for an excuse and why don't you go over there and teach them? 
You care that much? You have enough to use them for an excuse? Go teach them. Maybe that's your call to the mission field. Now, Christianity's gotten sort of pinkish nowadays. It's, it's, it, it's not red-blooded like it used to be. It's kind of like, well, I don't want this stuff that's going to cost me something. A whosoever loveth father, mother, sister, brother, husband, wife more than me cannot be my disciple. Another passage, he puts it a little bit stronger. He says, if you don't hate them, that you can't be my disciple. He doesn't mean hate them in the sin, but he means in comparison to loving me, you better be like hating them because you better choose me before you choose them. Christians can't take that anymore. I'm preaching hard preaching tonight. I may not be screaming and yelling and calling every uh, uh, sin to, to mind that you're doing. What I'm talking is hard stuff. You say, what are you presenting? I'm presenting a cross to you. That's what I'm presenting. I'm saying to you that it ain't right for you to decide what you're doing and keep fitting in with the world and let your kids fit in with the world. And just do whatever you jolly well please. Because what's the big deal? I mean, after all, everybody else does it, preacher. And I mean, you know, why do we have to be so separated and so called out and, and so freakish and so odd? Because at the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord will reward you with a crown. That's why. Amen. Because it will please Him. That's why. And you know what? The passage is you right there. You say, oh, well, what's going to happen to me? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. This passage right here, you know what he says? He says, That servant that knew and didn't do it shall be beaten with many stripes. Buddy, I hate to tell you this, but you'll lose a robe, you'll lose a crown, you'll lose gold, silver, and precious stones, you'll lose a right to rule and reign. Buddy, you can lose a lot more than just your salvation. You won't lose your salvation, but some of you, you know, you just keep doing what you want to do. And the one day, the time's going to run out. You may not have as long as I had. The Lord's going to blow the horn and out we go, man. And up we go and into the wild blue yonder. And then you're on the way. You're thinking, boy, this is great. Hallelujah, boy, this is good. Boy, I like this, man. Boy, look at this bird's eye view, man. Hallelujah, going to have to have a space capsule. Man, this is really good. And the closer you get to the judgment seat, you say, oh, 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 oh. That idiot preacher has been trying to tell me. Yeah, to him who much is given, much is required. Now, you don't need to worry about the people in the Philippines. Those people know by nature what to do. God will show them what to do after they're saved. They ain't got a Bible. They don't have somebody to teach them. I get my heart gets twisted up sometimes with that. That's bad going to a mission field. You see people that really have a need, really have a desire, and they want it, man. You, you, you get, you get, your heart gets twisted. You're thinking they need somebody to teach them. They need somebody to tell them. And Christians over here now, they just expect it, you know, whenever they decide to show up. Well, oh, God, you've got to be here now. I'm here now, so blow, blow it on me. Bless me, Lord, if you can. And those people over there, you get ready to sit down and have a meeting, man. They'll meet you going, coming, backward, forward, sideways, sit down after you're done preaching, sopping wet with sweat, and you're sitting over there. Uh, can you preach another one? Can you give me a few minutes here? Give you about 20 or 30 minutes and a glass of water, and then they'll come in there. You ready yet? <laughs> preach you for sometimes six or seven hours straight. People in Romania the same way. They come over to America and it's kind of like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll get there when we can. You say, what's going to happen? And the Lord's going to call you into account when you get to heaven. He's given some of you a chance now to get it right. And I hope you get it right. Some of you know what you'll do. You'll think, well, yeah. you get out here and you'll think, if I can just get out of here and get this thing off of me, I'll be fine. I'll settle down. Some of you are under such conviction right now, you can't hardly breathe. You can't move. Because you know the Holy Spirit telling you, He's telling the truth, He's telling the truth, He's telling the truth. Now you tell me, let's just weigh it, let's just judge it for a second. If what I'm telling you is true and you died and you were doing what I'm telling you to do, would you be ready or not to hit the judgment seat of Christ? If, if you're doing what I'm telling you to do, you'd be ready. If you're not, would you be ready? Well, then it must be true. You know what? The Lord put it right in your precious little hands where you want it. You have control over your destiny. You're eternally secure. Thanks, Kim. You have, you have, you're eternally secure because your destiny is fixed because of Calvary's cross and salvation. But now He gave you what you've always wanted. Well, I don't want to sweep no floors. You ever heard this statement? Why do I have to start sweeping floors? I want to start at the top. Lord says, you want to start at the top? No, I do, Lord. I want to start at the top. Okay, sweep your floors now and I'll give you the top position when you get there. Amen. Cross now, crown later. You know what Christians don't want today? They don't want no cross. That's why the church is a mockery, people. That's why it's a joke. Because our Christianity is what we call fair-weather Christianity. And I'm here to tell you the only thing that is going to still be here long after the preacher's gone, the building's gone, and everything else is Jesus Christ. You better spend some time pleasing Him instead of pleasing your cotton-picking self. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 
I may not make it to this other crown tonight, but that's all right. Verse, uh, is it verse 9 that says we are therefore laborers together? Is that how it starts? Get this. Excuse me. All right, verse 9. <clears throat> For we are our laborers together. Two words. With God. You're God's husbandry, you're God's building, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man, individual, personally, take heed how he, personally, individually, buildeth thereon. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There's your salvation. You can't lay that. So the Lord's the foundation. He lays down and lets you build on Him. Okay? If a man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it the work, because it the work shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it the work is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Ladies and gentlemen, he's trying to show you that your salvation is secure, but what you do after salvation is only secure if it's gold, silver, and precious stones. If it's not, if it's wood, hay, and stubble, you know what happens when it shows the fire? It's toast. You know what the tragedy is to me? You know, really, I'm, I'm, I'll be real honest with you. The tragedy is to me is that there's hundreds of thousands, millions probably of Christians that know absolutely nothing about what I'm telling you right now. And they're going to get up there and they're going to think, well, all I'll do is get me a little harp and a little cloud to ride around on. And the Lord's going to go, judgment seat of Christ. And they're going to be, oh, that's the great white throne, you know, out there we meet. You know, I preacher never thought nothing about preaching that. I, I don't know nothing about that. And the Lord's like, <clears throat> you had a Bible? You had the Holy Spirit, and if you lived anywhere in certain areas of the country, there was a Bible-believing church that you could have gone to to teach you. You know what they'll do? They ain't going to open their mouth. Because ignorance is not an excuse. Now, we got several policemen in here, but Brother Roger is a lieutenant, and Brother TK is a, a, a sergeant. Maybe it's changed since I was there. Isaiah's up here, uh, he's a policeman. You guys correct me now if I'm wrong and I'm not being funny. When I was there, they taught us that when it came to enforcing the law, that ignorance of the law was no excuse. Is that still true or not? In other words, if a guy comes over here from another country and in his country it's okay for him to break in a house and steal something, it doesn't matter if he doesn't realize that it's not okay over here, he still goes to jail for breaking in and stealing. Is that true? Okay. All right. In the mouth of two or more witnesses, let everything be established. That's what the three policemen said. All right. Now, if that's the case, do you really think that when you get up there to heaven that you can go, Well, Lord, I just didn't know. You know what? You're right. You didn't know. The spirit of the man doesn't know. But you know what's in you? The Holy Spirit that knows all things. Yea, even the deep things of God. Well, I just never yielded the floor to Him, I reckon, Lord. Golly gee, sure am sorry. Rick, what's going to happen? The Lord said, I'm going to knock the tar out of you. That's what's going to happen. But more than that, you're going to be displeasing to me. I can't put a crown on your head and I wanted to. I can't put a robe across your shoulders and I wanted to. I can't give you the chief seat at the table and I wanted to. I can't give you a city or a town to rule over and I wanted to. You know why? Because all you did was preserve yourself. All you did was live for yourself. All you did was care about what you wanted and what I could do for you. And you lived your whole life after salvation for yourself. Throw it in the fire. Boy, when that smoke begins to come up and it begins to burn and it begins to crackle and it burns like a whole field full of rubber tires the tears will begin to fall and hit that frozen firmament and you'll be screaming, God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. Give me a chance. God, I'm sorry. And what he'll say? Too late. Too late. 
I warned you, and I warned you, and I warned you, and you just were hell-bent on doing it your way. Fine. Now we're going to settle the accounts. And ladies and gentlemen, I do not teach that you should be striving to do what pleases the Lord to avoid a whipping. But I believe that if you love Him, that you're willing to do what He wants you to do no matter what the cost. Illustration and I'll close. I may be wrong in saying this and she can correct me. When I first met my wife, I did the thing that was expected. I went to her dad and I said, I'd like to marry your daughter. Thank the Lord he said, okay, he asked me you know, some questions and stuff like I, you know, I guess a dad would do and all. But you've known me a lot of time, a long time now. Do you really think that if he'd have said no, that I would have not married her? I'd have put her between a rock and a hard place. You know what I'd have said? It's either him or me. Now listen, you you want to go by all the stuff of well, I just think I know better than my daughter and better than my son and all that's your business. That's fine. I'm not making fun of you. I'm speaking for myself. So don't go out here and be offended. I don't want to choose. If my daughter comes and asks me, I'll tell her. If she don't want to go by it, then she can reap whatever she sows. It's her own deal. I'm not going to get between it. I just grind on some of you. Well, you ought to know. Well, maybe she's got some things to learn. But you know what? I said, I love you and I want to marry you. I think that if it were necessary... Even if it upset them, she'd have married me anyway. It's an illustration to say, you know what? If you really love the Lord, why do you always think about who it's going to upset and who it's going to bother before you choose the following? That's the strangest thing in the world. But when it comes to our own decisions, our own physical relationships, you know what we say? We're going to do what we want. I don't care who it bothers. But when it comes to the Lord, well, He understands. I don't think so. I think we're speaking for Him and acting. I can't find it in the Bible. Now, if you can, you let me know and I'll take the rebuke and I'll apologize. But ladies and gentlemen, in that Bible, He's pretty strong about laying that out. He just says, hey, this is how I want it to be done. You love me? Keep my words. You love me? Keep my commands. What are the commands for us? Hey, the love of Christ constrains me. The Lord says, hey, peacock, yes, sir. This is what I want you to do. You know what's on trial? My love for Him. He already proved, didn't He, TK, His love for me? He died for me, right? You know what's on trial, Brother Larry? Whether or not I love Him. So the Lord says to me, hey, peacock, this is what I want you to do. Peter, you love me? Oh, uh, yeah, Lord. Sure. Really? More than these dead fish? You're willing to die yourself, your dreams, your ideas, your business, your thoughts? You ready to get caught up in the net and do what I'm telling you to do, Peter? By the third time, Peter says, I do. And you know what the Lord says? Now you've grown up, Peter. He spake of how Peter should die. Peter finally said, you know what, Lord, what I want to do, where I want to go, if I want to go fishing, I want to go back to the commercial way of making a living and all that. You know what, Lord? I just want to do whatever you want me to do and all that's dead. And if they want to nail me to a cross, don't matter. I'm done living for me. That a boy, Peter. So you know what the Lord's given you a chance to do? You know what all five crowns mean? That you loved Him more than you loved yourself. They're a testimony of your love for Him. How many crowns are you going to have? So how do I get that crown? Somebody's going to die. Your will is going to die. Your way is going to die. Your dreams may die. Your wishes may die. The Lord said, 
I'll make it up to you. Peter says to him one time, and I like Peter. Brother Gene Peter says to him, he said, Lord, you know, what about those of us that gave up houses and lands and families and all that? You know what the Lord says? I'll give it back to you multiples. Because I'm not going to be beholden to any of you. Anything you've given to me, I'll make sure you get it back and then some. You make a good investment? Say, oh, well, what do you want, preacher? You going to take up an offering? No, no. No. You know what the Lord's looking for? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You know what He wants? He wants you. You know what He says when He puts that crown on your head, Brother Brad? He loved me. Last, John refers to himself inspired and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God as the disciple whom Jesus loved. The Holy Spirit wrote that in there. John's a type of the church. The type of a Christian that says, you know what? I love the Lord. How do I know? He's the one who put the crown on me. He's the one that's the judge. It's evidence right here of my love for Him. Say, why? Because He's worthy to be loved. What will it cost me? Nothing compared to what it cost Him. A Christian, if you can get that, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, it won't be with fear, dread, and terror. It'll be, thank God I finally get to see the one who I love. Thank God I finally get to be with the one whom I love. Thank God that now that I'm with the one that I love, I'm finally happy because I've been reunited with the only thing that matters to me. And you get that right there. Your Christian life will turn from one of, oh, what can I do now? to, what do I get to do next? The Lord is grinding a little bit. Must be something in this one then. Lord, it's hard. Yeah, it must be worth something. My daddy always told me, he said, if it's worth something, it's probably going to make you sweat. It's probably going to cost you something. When I first started working out and training back years ago, man, I was so stinking sore, man, I would hurt. My daddy said, well, son, if you want to be like Jerry Daniels, it's going to cost you something. You want a crown? It won't cost you something. Your salvation's free, it's paid for. His love for you, it's free. Not in question. How about yours? The judgment seat of Christ, if he asks us this. Hey David. Yes, sir, Lord. You love me? I can't go, well, sure, Lord, you know what the Lord's gonna say? We'll throw it in the fire. We'll see. Because Christian, there is one thing on trial in your life after you're saved. It's who you love. Everything that you do is motivated by who you love. Everything. The preacher just tell us how to dress right and spit white and do all that other kind you fall in love with Jesus Christ, that stuff takes care of itself. And you know what? No matter how many things I tell you to do, if you love yourself more than you love Him, those things are going to quit being done anyway. Because you can't keep doing it. It will not motivate you enough to be scared or guilt-tripped. But you know what will? You know what will make it last forever? Love. And by the way, in this context, it's a verb. It requires action. Father, sure do thank You for the night. Lord, sure do like talking about You. God, I pray that You might be with us and help us to grasp this topic, this subject. Lord, even more important than knowing the significance of all the crowns, more important to know You. God, I pray that You'll help us with these matters and You'll rekindle the fires in our hearts, Lord, of our love for Thee. 
Lord, You'll prepare us for the days to come. The difficulty, the struggles, the trials, the problems that are sure to take place. And God, that when the struggles begin and the trials begin to come, Lord, that we'll simply realize it's an opportunity for us to prove our love for Thee. God, bless these people that have come. And I pray, God, that You might help us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.